So that's where we start today with some of our favorite reporters and friends, national investigative reporter with The Washington Post, Carol Lennig, Ken Vogel, political reporter at The New York Times, former U.S. attorney Harry Littman, at the table, Associated Press White House reporter Jonathan Lemire, and Donnie Deutsch. Harry, we left out five of your titles, and we'll, we'll get to them and add them before we start talking to you. I have to start, though, with Ken Vogel and Carol Lennig. Some unbelievable reporting from you and your colleagues this, this week. You guys have obviously poured over this transcript with all of your knowledge about the Manafort case. Ken Vogel, your piece Monday um, was described to me by a former U.S. government official as akin to a unicorn sighting. These, these descriptions of what lies at the heart of the Mueller probe, the collusion branch of that, these contacts between Donald Trump's former campaign chairman and Konstantin Kalimnik. You've been on this beat for many, many months. Just, just talk about what you've been writing about this week and its significance in the broader Mueller probe. Yeah, the significance of uh, what Weissman laid out in this court filing that you just described is that it gives some visibility into what Mueller is actually pursuing that is specific to the mission and the task that he was assigned by the Department of Justice. That is to investigate Russian meddling in the election and possible collusion with Trump's campaign. We've seen a number of indictments, guilty pleas, uh, and uh, convictions that have sort of been around the edges of that and at times have flicked at some of the re some relevance to that core mission. But this was really the first time that we had seen him directly relate uh, one of their really central cases against Paul Manafort to that mission. And so it naturally raises questions, some of which uh, I and my colleagues and the folks at The Washington Post, including Carol, have done yeoman's work unpacking in the months uh, and in some cases years before this. I reported in August of 2016, while Manafort was still on the campaign, that he had this relationship with Konstantin Kalimnik and that Konstantin Kalimnik had come to the United States to meet with him. And you would think that that would raise questions among folks uh, who were looking into ties between the Trump campaign and Russia and possible collusion. Now we know for certain that the key person, Mueller, who is tasked with, with, with really investigating this, it is of interest to him. Ken, what you're reporting this week, what you're analyzing this week is so important in the context of the president's sort of PR effort around the efforts of the Senate Intel Committee. And I wonder if just in, 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 in sort of a, a short description, you can underscore what you just said about, about reporting that, that on your part, on your newspaper's part, goes back to when these events actually happened in real time. In 2016, you were aware of Manafort meeting with this uh, Putin-aligned operative and and that these have ended up being the kinds of contacts Robert Mueller is still scrutinizing so said one of his top deputies prosecutor Andrew Weissman that's very different from what the Senate Intel Committee looked at they didn't they did as far as I know they didn't um, sit with Konstantin Kalimnik it's not clear that these same interactions are at the heart of what they looked at is it Ken uh, oh yeah so uh, no I mean the the, the um in some ways, they are looking, the, the Senate Intelligence Committee, the House Intelligence Committee are looking at some of the same stuff, but they also have a much broader remit. And they can, in, in some ways, they are, have more freedom to be able to weave a narrative and connect some of these dots that aren't, necessar that aren't necessarily requiring a, uh, the sort of formal confines of an indictment or a legal proceeding to introduce. Uh, but we know that they are also, you know, so while they are looking at some of this stuff, they are also looking at Donald Trump's businesses and the, the ways in which those businesses have, have uh, uh, crossed paths with Russians and have actually targeted Russia for possible development. And that is, thus far, we have not seen any evidence that Mueller is going down those paths. So in some ways, these are complementary. Uh, we certainly have seen Mueller use some of the transcripts from uh, congressional inquiries to bring charges. Uh, in some ways, they are disparate. And obviously, also, the um, uh, congressional investigators have the benefit of not having quite as, uh, as much pressure on them to wrap up an investigation as Mueller has. And they can continue these things as part of normal congressional oversight that you would see of any administration. <laughs> 
Carol Lennig, I saw your tweet about your colleagues reporting today right after I read it. And, and, um, and it, it, I, I'm going to botch it, but it was something, you know, the story has cigar bars and it, it also ties together <laughs> some threads that you and your colleagues have been pursuing for, as Ken just said, more than two years. Talk about w what you added to the, our understanding of why this is of interest and some of the rich color that was in your piece today on this topic. You know, Nicole, I, I find it, this story so fascinating, and uh, hats off to Roz Helderman and Tom Hamburger who wrote it, but it is also, um, it's almost like when you have one of those puzzles you get for a holiday gift, and there are like seven really hard pieces, and you, they're just empty on the board, and you don't know where to put them, and it's like we're getting some of the really hard puzzle pieces now in this unsealed, I'm sorry, in this sealed hearing partial transcript. And that story, in terms of the two Two and a half years of gathering string about this case. Ken so right about August 2016, the, the stories that were being written about Manafort's unusual connections to Russians and Konstantin Kalimnik, a former GRU officer who was viewed by the U.S. government as an intelligence asset. I, I um, forgive me, a, a Russian asset, an operative. It's so amazing that now we are learning that, that this August 2nd meeting comes in the middle of so much drama, Nicole. You know, you, you have the president, I'm sorry, the, the nominee, Republican nominee for president, saying a ton of things that mm -hmm. don't really seem to speak to American voters. Hey, I think most of those people in Crimea want to be with Russia anyway. <laughs> yeah. What a bizarre thing to be saying, right, on the, on the campaign trail. You have the platform change at the convention, which was always sort of suspicious, but, but poo-pooed by people in in the GOP as <clears throat> having nothing to do with Russians. You had the, um, the, the comments um, from various people, now we know secretly, and we reported some of this last year, you have Manafort saying, I'll give private briefings to that guy, Oleg Deripaska, a, a, a Putin ally. And now we know on August 2nd that, that a, a, a Deripaska ally was asking to meet with Manafort, saying, I've spoken with this guy for five hours. I've got important messages to relay to you. Let's meet. I, I, it seems to me that there's something very bizarre about the fact that all of these happen in the same amount of time, in the same so period. I want to stay on that, Carol, because it's not just what you point out that all those things happen. And I believe at the time, Donald Trump was saying equally bizarre things about America being just as bad as Russia. He said on Morning Joe, I don't know if it was in these in these two weeks, but he talked about, you know, well, Americans are killers, too. He said it to Joe, uh, my colleagues, Joe Scarborough, Mika Brzezinski, and he said something um, equally bizarre to Bill O'Reilly. But it, this is also the one thing that the campaign that really couldn't coordinate many messages all lied about. They all lied about these kinds of conversations and these kinds of contacts. So if you could take what you just described, these seemingly at the time bizarre contacts with people aligned with Russian intel, and add the, the more recent layer that Manafort, Gates, Flynn, they all lied about their contacts and their conversations about sanctions with Russians. Absolutely. You know, and one of the things that's revealed, Nicole, I'm glad you brought this up, but one of the things that, that is revealed in that transcript is that uh, Manafort's attorneys insist he wasn't lying in his last 12 sessions and interviews and two grand jury appearances, but he was just confused or forgetful. Um, Man, you know, Flynn uh, tried to say that he um, forgive me, Michael Flynn, tried to say that he had also not intended to lie to FBI agents just a few days um, into his nomination, forgive me, his, his appointment as national security advisor. He wasn't intending to lie, um, but ultimately he pled guilty to lying mm -hmm. about conversations with a Russian ambassador. <clears throat> also, um, I guess the most important thing probably to say about all of those lies and all of those Trump allies is all of their lies have to do with the conversations they had to communicate with Russians about things that the Rus that Putin cared the most deeply about. Putin cared about uh, 
uh, first and foremost, um, making sure sanctions were removed because it was uh, perilous to his sort of power network. He cared deeply about the Ukraine and Crimea. He cared deeply about being a power on the world stage. And, and Donald Trump, the nominee for president, was echoing Putin's talking points. So Harry Littman, tie this together for me, the way an investigator and a prosecutor would tie together the reporting Ken and Carol are talking about, the, the, the idea that all these people, and, and this is their own branding, they describe their campaign and Donald Trump's candidacy as the gang that couldn't have colluded because we couldn't collude with our press office. But right. let me put this up. Michael Cohen pursued business deals on Trump's behalf. Uh, Trump Tower Moscow lied about it to Congress. Donald Trump Jr. discussed sanctions with a Russian agent and a room full of Russians promising dirt on Hillary Clinton, later lied about it and got a bunch of White House aides to lie about it as well, saying it was about adoptions. July and August, Paul Manafort discussed policy with the Russian operatives that we're talking about today, Konstantin Kalimnik and others, lied about it to Mueller. These, these hearings are all about, as Carol and, and Ken have said, those lies. And December 2016, Flynn, who had every right every right as an incoming national security advisor to talk about sanctions policy did so and then lied about it what does that look like to investigators harry right to a prosecutor what really gets their antenna buzzing out of control is first this point that carol and ken have teased out and really meticulous reporting by the way they have this manuscript and they've they've read it so carefully for key points and then the attempts to hide a really rich little detail that would get prosecutors uh, totally focused. Gates, Kalimnik, and Manafort all leave by separate exits at this now infamous <laughs> August 2nd, 2016 meeting. Something is going on and you want to know. And what else gets them going? That the counterpoint to Russia's key interests in Crimea in the sanctions are the personal interests of the players. Manafort's to get out of, of debt with their Pasca, Trump to build the tower, Flynn that wants the sanctions released having something to do with his lobbying. So you have a, the, the sort of thing people do lie about because they are um, keeping cover of their own personal financial interests that they're trading for the national interests of, of Russia. Added to that, by the way, was Trump's bizarre um, downplaying of the importance of NATO at just this time in the campaign. So all that together, but especially the lies and attempts to conceal, have, have a gang like Weissman and Mueller boring in to the very, very core. Here's the problem, and this is a precursor of the month. You can see it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, but unfortunately, and this is why the, the Senate intelligence community has come out, uh, intelligence uh, Burr has come out and said, well, there's no direct collusion. Even with all of this and more, and the Mueller probe comes out, unless you have Trump saying, okay, okay, Vlad, here's the deal. I get Trump Tower. I mean, I get the Moscow Tower. You don't release the PP tape, and I'll cover you on Ukraine, and I'll get rid of that little Manitsky Act. I don't know if this gets us, at least us hoping that Trump is not there forever, where we need to get to. It's a lot of yes, 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 I get it. But now, does this ever get you with a two-thirds vote in the Senate? Absolutely not. So that's my concern. The more and more I hear about all of this, I go, yeah. But if you don't have the smoking gun, if you don't have that one kill shot, is this all for naught? And that's my question. Well, and, and I mean, go, did someone, was that you, Harry? Well, yeah, um, I was going to say, look, we're, we're, we're certain spraying a lot of bullets around that, that do show the, the, um, the structure of a real conspiracy between the campaign and and russia the, the the missing piece i agree with donnie is is some sense of of trump's knowledge but there are many uh possible avenues including gates by the way who's the big source of this story uh from which Mueller could conclude knowledge on trump's part also stone L let me just offer a, a, another and chris christie once said what do you work for Mueller? i i, I do not um but but i mean one sort of other piece of information, and you're talking about the politics and public opinion, um, and, and I think the Trump base seems to be a fact-free zone, so I, I don't totally disagree with you, but 
the conduct under scrutiny, the conduct that led them to open a counterintelligence investigation was confirmed when a counterintelligence investigation was opened into Donald Trump while he was president. The conduct was confirmed when he answered a question to you in Helsinki about why he believes Vladimir Putin over his intelligence community. Um, and, it, it, you know, and he basically just looked at you and said, because I do. I mean, the, the conduct... So where does this take us? Where does it take well, I don't know where it takes you, but, but I'm just... My only point is all of these threats threads that Carol and Ken have been following for two and a half years are confirmed. Donald Trump hasn't made an about face. I mean, he's still, it's, whether it's the tinkle tape or something else, he is still acting as though he's right. in the it, throes it, of his affair with Putin. That's right. I mean, the, the sort of eyebrow raising statements and questions that he would come up with during the campaign are things he's still doing now. I mean, he, is, right. he has not changed his rhetoric whatsoever. And, and despite the obviously in intense pressure from the investigations, not just on the Hill, but from Mueller, he has not backed down. He has right. not changed his story. He right. has not suggested suddenly done a 180 and changed how he feels with Vladimir Putin. In fact, he has double and triple down on his appreciation for Putin, <laughs> his, his unwillingness to criticize Putin, even as members of his own party and members of his own administration have right. done so. That has not changed. And you're right, this is, this is a yet another it is a big piece of the puzzle. We don't see the whole picture yet. Only right. Mueller does, or, we, or he's putting it together. Uh, you know, and we also don't know that we ever will fully see it. Will a full report come out? Right. Will there be that moment that I think the American public really wants that could lead to... Well, that's the, what I'm saying. Kill, I, kill I, I think everybody is anticipating this Mueller report. I think there's going to be a hundred more things like this, but if it doesn't land, it doesn't land, and that's sad. Um, I, I agree with you. I, I have one more question for you. What is, you know, the, the, the withdrawal from Syria, you know, served Putin's foreign policy interests. Sure. This is all reporting about someone in there. It looks like they hardwired the Trump team to carry out a foreign policy agenda. Is there anything left on it? Right. I mean, you're right. I mean, it, there is, it's been said more than once, but if Vladimir Putin could design a foreign policy, it, you know, it would be in many ways what we're seeing from the Trump White House, with, you know, a few exceptions here or there, Syria being another great example. To, to this point, the president has not issued actions recognizing Crimea or Ukraine as part of, the, of Russia, but like there have been moments where he sort of sounded okay, that, that could be wood, on that Jonathan. way. That's right. <laughs> Don't mean to jinx yes. anything. Yeah. Um, but, but you're right. It, you know, Putin is, was so concerned, as it was outlined at the beginning of this segment, about still having that position as world power, with Russia's influence fading. And he was terrified, the idea of, of Hillary Clinton, someone he deeply dislikes, you know, becoming president and further ratcheting up the pressure on Russia and reducing them on the world stage. And instead, he has been handed a series of foreign policy victories that has elevated him. And he's gotten that from this president, if nothing else. All right. Carol Enig and Ken Vogel, I'm going to make a confession, a TV confession. At the beginning of all this, I would hear Konstantin Kalimnik, and it was like, wah, wah, wah to me. I'd say, who that? who's that? I thank God for all your reporting on this thread, for keeping it alive, for following this, and for finding things in that manuscript that, for my quick reading, I didn't see. You guys are, are really, really important. Thank you very much. Harry Lippman, thank you for making sense of it all. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me, or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.